as we open this up with prayer, <clears throat> um, we start off today with, uh, as always, Abiyah, was as we come before your throne and we humble our hearts and 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 ease our minds and focus on your throne and the goodness and 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 all the things that you've promised us in Torah, Abiyah. We just come to you today and say. Torah Rabbah for everything that you do, Father, for blessing us, for protecting us, for sustaining us. Torah Rabbah for God and our families, Abiyah, and keeping us secure in these last days as, um, you know, as 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 the world is worlding today, Abiyah. We just thank you um, for showing us the correct path forward um, to all of our brothers and sisters that may be too caught up in two the governmental Babylonian system um, and from being trodden down and beaten, some may even look to it for salvation, Abiyah. We just ask you today to uh, open up your scriptures to all those who seek you, Abiyah. Open up the hearts of your people and all those who uh, care to know um, and to grow closer to you and the words that you have given this world for instruction, Abiyah, to be righteous um, individuals, Abiyah, and to be to fulfill the purpose of creation of why you created man and woman, of which we'll we'll go through tonight. We thank you, Father Yah, for sound minds and healthy bodies for enduring uh, the strength to endure to the end, Abiyah. Uh, we give you all honor, glory, and praise in all things, Father Yah. And we just want to acknowledge you, Father, yeah, and, and, and give you your proper respect for opening all doors, closing all doors that need be closed, um, and separating us from anything that is is working, working against us, drawing closer to you and being part of your temple, your tabernacle, and your family that you are establishing. I pray that you forgive us all of all of our sins, Abba, yeah, that you have mercy up on us, Father, yeah. And that you continue to allow us to walk in your Torah, that you open it up to us to be a blessing of encouragement and inspiration on being better um, partakers of the promise and the covenant that you made with our ancestors. Hallelujah. And to um, guide us and be a light in dark times. In the name of your only begotten son, Yahushua Hamashiach, we pray all things. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. All things. Hallelujah. What's up, John? Amen. Come on, everyone. Hallelujah. So as we begin today, um, I didn't know that the shirt behind me. As we begin today, uh, we ended last week with Adam and Eve. They come to Yah. They're out the garden, and they're like, um. You know, the, the beasts, they 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 used to be friendly to us and now they snarl at us and make noises and so on and so forth. And it says at the end of chapter seven, where we stopped, it says, and Elohim commanded the beasts and the birds and all that moves on the earth to come to Adam and to be familiar with him and not to trouble him in Eve, nor yet any of the good righteous among their offspring, which is, a uh, you know, in none of the good and righteous among their offspring, which I believe that word to still be true today. Um, the beast won't will, 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 will be familiar with and not trouble. Then all the beasts paid homage to Adam according to the commandment of Elohim, except the serpent against which Elohim was angry. It did not come to Adam with the beast. And I made a point last week that and then this I was just kind of, you know, thinking about this, that, you know, some of these beasts uh, or the serpent, um, and we know that it walked up on legs because its punishment was the legs was taken and it had to crawl on its belly. Um, you know, did the fallen angels or the one that did something possess this serpent and use it to talk to Eve in a way Um to entice her to sin. And I kind of just gave a thought. It was not really nothing I was standing on. It was just a thought um, on the subject. And, um, and is Yah angry at this particular beast for allowing itself to be used in that manner? 
And it's like I say, it's just kind of a thought, but we'll get further into it as we go. Um, as we start off with chapter eight today, and I know he's going to mention the serpents again. I kind of mentioned that last week. So we hopefully will make it to the part when he does. Um, but chapter eight today, the bright nature of man is taken away. So Adam and Eve had a different nature um, in the garden than what has been passed down to us now. It says, then Adam cried and said, O Elohim, when we lived in the garden and our hearts were filled, were lifted up, we saw the angels that sang praises in the Shemaim, but now we can't see like we used to. No, when we entered the cave, all creation became hidden to, from us. Then Elohim, the Most High Yah said to Adam, when you were under subjection to me, you had a bright nature within you. And for that reason, could you see things far away? But after your transgression, your bright nature was withdrawn from you. And it was not left to you to see things far away, but only near at hand. After the ability of the flesh, for it is brutish. When Adam and Shuah had heard these words from Elohim, they went their way, praising and worshiping him with a sorrowful heart. And Elohim ceased to commune with them. And just for this time, because he'll be back to talk to them. But we see that part of this bright nature, and I, I, I'm a liken it to a term, they had spiritual eyes, they could see spiritual things. They could see far away. They could see into the heavens or heavenly things. And now they say, and they can't. That's something that was taken from them. And when we get to the serpent, we're going to see something else that was taken. Hallelujah. Then Adam and Chua came out of the cave of treasures and went near to the garden gate. And there they stood to look at it and cried for having come away from it. And Adam and Chua went from before the gate of the garden to the southern side of it and found there the water that watered the garden from the root of the tree of life. Let me read that again. And Adam and Chua went before the gate of the garden to the southern side of it. Remember, he put them on the west and found there the water that watered the garden from the root of the tree of life and that split itself from there into four rivers over the earth. Then they came and went near to that water and looked at it and saw that it was the water that came forth from under the root of the tree of life in the garden. That's interesting. And Adam cried and wailed and beat his chest for being severed from the garden and said to Chua, why have you brought on me, on yourself and, and on our descendants, so many of these plagues and punishments? And Eve or Chua said to him, what is it you have seen that has caused you to cry and to speak to me in this manner? And he said to Chua, do you not see this water that was with us in the garden that watered the trees of the garden and flowed out from there? And we, when we were in the garden, did not care about it. But since we came to this strange land, we love it and turn and, and, and turn it to use for our body. So with the bright nature and, the, and what they were in, they didn't need water, at least not to bathe. And now he's like, now we need it to clean ourselves. You know, we didn't even care about it. It was just something nice in the garden. But when Shawa heard these words from him, she cried and from the soreness of their crying, they fell into the water. They fell into that water and would have put an end to themselves in it so as never again to return. And behold, the creation. For when they looked at the work of creation, 
They felt they must put an end to themselves. And this is a common theme, at least early on. I'm probably going to encounter it tonight where Adam and Eve would be so in despair, as it says here, that they are going to go on multiple times um, feeling like they want to kill themselves or that they want to die. And we're going to see that Abi Yah is not going to allow them to. And he's going to tell them, you can't. You all got to fulfill your purpose, not for creation, so that we can reconcile this in the end. It's, it's so many words is how he's going to present it. But I'll keep going. <clears throat> Chapter 10, their bodies need water after they leave the garden, once again. Then Elohim, merciful and gracious, looked at them, thus lying in the water and close to death, and sent an angel who brought them out of the water and laid them on the seashore as dead. So y'all seen them in this water. Maybe this is where it came from, man. Negroes can't swim. <laughs> Y'all seen them in this water close to death, and he sent an angel to bring them out. Which, and you know, that even that's interesting because we we didn't see other times when Israelites would be in water, and y'all would send something to bring them out. Case in point, Jonah. He was in the water. He was doing something. He had no he didn't have no business doing. Y'all had a fish swallow him up, and then spit him back out on the seashore where he was supposed to be, and not where he was running to. Then the angel went. Then the angel went up to Elohim, was welcome, and said, Abba Yah, your creatures have breathed their last breath, basically. They have passed on. Then Elohim sent his word to Adam and Chua, who raised them from the dead. And make a note of this, because it, it's going to specifically say that he sent his word multiple times. And, you know, I kind of mentioned the first time we read this that, I do, I do actually do believe that like it's being specific when it says that Elohim sent his word because we know the word to be who we call the Messiah. And this is who even all the way at the beginning is basically really already playing like the high priest covering shepherd to Adam and Eve when it's just them two. And it said he raised them from the dead, which kind of plays into I am the resurrection, how he would speak like that, right? Um, I've already resurrected that down before. And Elohim said, after he was raised, and, I, and Adam said after he was raised, oh yeah, while we were in the garden, we did not require or care for this water. They weren't drinking it. They didn't need it to bathe. They had this bright nature. Um, I think that's an interesting point, speaking of trying to go back into the kingdom, which is the goal for us here. Um, it kind of gives us a, a view of what it's like, I guess, is, is kind of, for lack of a better word, what I'm trying to say. But since we came to this land, we cannot do without water. And, you know, even, even still now to this day, even more than food, a person will... Uh, um, like even when you fast and a lot of times and probably all the time you'll need water before you even need food and Adam said we cannot do without it then Elohim said to Adam while you were under my command and were a bright angel see when Adam was in righteousness when they were in their in their as, as Hamashiach said, and I don't know if it's exactly this, but I believe it to be something like in 1 Corinthians when he said, I will, um, the righteous will be raised in the sky at the last trump and they will be given the same nature they see on me, they will be given. I believe Adam had something very similar, if not that nature, and it, he was considered to be angelic. He was immortal. He didn't have to eat. Now, Yah told him to be fruitful and multiply while in the garden. I've always wondered, you know, I 
because I don't believe it to be the same as as the punishment as I sent them out the garden, man, woman will give will have children, childbearing and pain and this and that. So I've always kind of wondered, like, how exactly would that have been? But I guess it don't matter. We ain't make it that far. But while you were under my command and were a bright angel, you knew not this water. You didn't need it. But now that you have transgressed my commandment, you cannot do without water, wherein to wash your body and make it grow. For it is now like that of beasts and is in want of water, saying that you have, since you've taken off your heavenly nature, your earthly nature is brutish, as it said, or, or like beasts. And now you need water the same way the beasts do, which makes me think. The animals, because we know they were in the garden, did they drink water? We know from Isaiah's other scriptures where it talk about all the animals being in peace and eating eating the wheat and not eating each other. Basically, a lamb, a lamb will be next to a lion and they'll both eat the grass. And so I guess that's just an interesting side note as well. When Adam and Eve heard these words from Elohim, they cried a bitter cry. And Adam entreated Elohim to let him return into the garden. And look at it a second time. Same thing we all saying, Adam. We want to look at it a first time. But Elohim said to Adam, I have made you a promise. When that promise is fulfilled, I will bring you back into the garden. You and your righteous descendants. And Elohim seeks to commune with Adam. So we see here that, I, you know, it's something else that sticks out to me with the water is we know that Amashiach speaks of the water as the washing of the word. Um, and the immersion is like a washing of the word or, or uh, being immersed in um, the instructions of the righteousness, the righteous instructions that leads us to righteousness um, through Yah. And Adam them is saying they need the word with it, 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 the water in the same way that we need the word because man can't live by bread alone, right? So I think that's an interesting um, parallel in how Adam is using that. And if anybody got any questions or comments, you can just, you know, you can jump in at any time. We just read. A recollection of the glorious day, a recollection of the glorious days in the garden. Then Adam and Chua felt themselves burning with thirst and heat and sorrow. First time ever feeling thirst, heat, and sorrow. <laughs> you know, I, and I make, I, I always try to make note of that when I see stuff like that. Like, yeah, remember when Adam and Eve are burning with heat, thirst, and sorrow. It is the first time ever that this is happening. And Adam said to Eve, we shall not drink of this water, even if we were to die. Oh, Eve, when this water comes into our inner parts, it will increase our punishments and that of our descendants. He's never drunk water, which I think that's interesting. Oh, man, I got these coyotes yelling out here. Hold on, hold on. Hey, there it go. Let's feel behind the house. I'll be hearing the coyotes running through it. It's crazy, kind of. With that being said, um, they've never had water. I mean, I think that. <laughs> that, that I think that can be said enough. Both Adam and Eve then went away from the water and drank none of it at all, but came and entered the cave of treasures where Yah put them. I wonder what the Hebraic name of this would be. I mean, I looked up the word cave and treasures. But when in it, Adam could not see. Remember, he even kind of said the cave is like a prison, even though Yah is like, it's not a prison. It's just where you live. But he like, when we in it, we can't look into the sky no more. We can't see the heavens. 
Um, and it kind of reminds me of the scripture. I think it's in Deuteronomy 28 where he said, over your head will be iron and under your feet will be brass. Almost like, you know, part of the punishment, you're going to be shut in. You won't be able to. And I thought about this recently when I read that, like you, we won't be able to spiritually look up on the heavens anymore. But it's just a thought. When Adam was in the cave, he told Eve he couldn't see. He only heard the noise she made. Neither could she see Adam, but heard the noise he made. Then Adam cried in deep affliction and beat his chest. And he got up and said to Eve, where are you? And she said to him, look, I am standing in this darkness. He then said to her, remember the bright nature in which we lived when we lived in the garden. Oh, Eve. Remember the glory that rested on us in the garden. O oh, Eve, remember the trees that overshadowed us in the garden while we moved among them. O oh, Eve, remember that while we were in the garden, we knew neither night or day. There was no sunsets and sunrises. Think of the tree of life from below which flowed the water and that shed lust, lustry or luster maybe over us. I'm not sure that word. Remember, O oh Eve, the garden land and the brightness thereof. Think, O oh think of that garden in which was no darkness while we lived in it. That's what we doing now, thinking of the garden in which there is no darkness. Prayerfully hoping we can make it back to that place. So just think. I have a comment. We have not even seen yet. I'm going to read this last verse and then you could go. We have not even seen yet um, the sunrise and all that, which is going to be a big thing. But it's given us a couple things. They've never seen a sunrise or sunset. I'm not sure they've ever seen the sun or the moon, even though we know that they're created because y'all created them on the fourth day but I'm not sure that they've even seen it. I'm, matter of fact, I'm positive they have not seen the sun with the way they're going to react to it in a minute. Um, they didn't need water for washing, washing themselves. They didn't need water to drink. It's the first time that they felt pain and heat and sorrow and, and other things. Like it's a lot of firsts here in all of mankind, um, which was one of the things that always stood out to me about this book. And the last verse, and then you can go, Hananiah Zion, he says, whereas no sooner did we come into this cave of treasures, than darkness surrounded us all around, leaving out the garden into the world. And that's, that's, that's kind of really like a lesson in itself. When you leave from under the being commanded and guided by Yah, and you get into the world, you are surrounded by darkness all around, he says. And mind you, like, it's, it's, it's interesting that it, it, it's only them, <laughs> at least to my understanding, it's only them. And he's like, we're surrounded by darkness until we can no longer see each other. And all the pleasure of this life has come to an end. So Adam and Eve can feel the punishment of not being in paradise immediately is, is kind of what he's saying here. Ananias Zion, it's on you. Shalom, family. Shalom. Okay, so this is the where I have a question with this. Um, you know, you know, in the beginning, he um, separated the darkness. No, he called darkness night and night day. I mean, night. Darkness, night, and day he called morning, and then that was the first day. So, how did he never see darkness? Well, uh, hey, I really don't have an answer. Just one of the things that no, I'm not, I'm not asking you a question. I'm, I'm <laughs> about it because you know, when I read this book, I had a few questions, but I didn't remember reading that part. But when you read, I was like, now, wait a minute. You know, because it's questionable on a lot of things, but that's one thing that I was like, wait a minute now. So you're talking in Genesis chapter one, um, verse three, and Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light, 
And Elohim saw the light that it was good and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening in the morning, first day. And then we know he does that on the second day, the third day. And he ends every day with evening, wow. morning, and it's a day. So to the point of what you're saying, though, even on this first day, when he separates the light from the dark and he calls the light good and the darkness, he divided the light from the darkness and the light is day, the darkness night, and he called and the light is he saw that the light was good. Mm -hmm. Um there was no sun and moon on the first day. So this light and this darkness that he's separating here, and this has just always been my thinking. Um <laughs> It's something different than what we see with sun, moon, night, day, light, and darkness that he separated. Mm. Because remember, on, he don't create the sun and the moon to the fourth day. So that's a good question. What is this light and this darkness that he's separating here? Because there is no sun and moon yet. Yeah, that's interesting. It is interesting, and I, I don't have an answer exactly for you. It, you know, it's one of those things that's just beyond me. Um, but it is an interesting point that you make. It's a good thought. True. Is it possible it could it be referring to good and evil? Because it talks about the darkness over the face of the deep. Yes. I've always thought that. Um and when you bring up the word in Hebrew for darkness here is, is koshek, and it means misery, destruction, death, ignorance. It it's also means to be dark, but it's, it's figuratively sorrow, wickedness, which makes sense that Adam is saying for the first time he feels sorrow, probably misery. Um, so I've always thought Genesis 1 to be that, but like I say, it 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 that's one of those things that, you know, it's subjective, so... <laughs> I can't really stand on you with no bunch of scriptures about it. Maybe some, but you know, this ain't that. It's, it's a subjective thought here. Just like with uh, Adam. Akobadai, I see your hand. Uh, uh, well, I had taken it down uh, when uh, Daniel uh, responded. That was uh, basically uh, exactly the same thing. I was uh, thinking that uh, he separated himself from uh, uh, Hatan because he's evil and him uh, being the light because uh, you know with, he doesn't need the sun to uh, produce light he is light himself mm -hmm. sure. in the end, uh, he will he will, uh, uh, you know, the, the sun will be extinguished and all the light will come from him and him alone. So that's why I'm thinking the light that he separated was himself from Hasatan. I've always been of the same thought as well. But like I say, this is one of those as some people would say, like blind spots in, in the scripture where it can be subjective. I see in the chat, uh, I, I, Mike, Big Mike, you put maybe because they were around the tree of life. I do believe that plays a part too. Um, and we understand that even in Revelation, um, so I guess we do have some precepts. I shouldn't say we don't have anything. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, because it's, no, he's there because, you know, he talked with him in the cool of the day. Like, can you imagine being in the presence of the Yahuwah and knowing how bright it is? Mm -hmm. yes. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just bright, you know. But then you walk outside of the garden. And Your phone was breaking up. And you're on mute now. What you said you walk outside of the garden and what now? Revelation 21. Yeah, it, it, it's a couple. It's a couple of these revelations that um 
Revelation 21, 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of Elohim did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof, which I, once again is subjective, but I've always viewed the tree of life as being the lamb, which is why I view the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as being Hasatan and understanding that Hasatan is a title the original fallen angel who was the first one to sin that was the dragon that pulled a third of the angels. I view him as that. Um, and they even have another precept for that is what I was going to read in Revelation 22, where it's now it's talking about that river we're talking about. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. Um, in the midst of the streets and go on and so forth. And then Revelation 22, 5, and there shall be no night there and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For Yahuwah, the Most High Yah, give them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So I guess it is two precepts that go along with this idea. So, well, I guess what I really meant was, I just don't know how to frame the idea. <laughs> but yeah, that, those are some precepts that kind of go along with the idea. Anything else anybody want to add to this before we move forward? And shalom to everybody. Mama Speed, Angel, um, Akoti, Kathy. Shalom. Black DJ. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Black Big Mike, shalom. Um, I see the hobby them in the chat, but I don't see them in here. I, I don't know how they're doing it. Shalom, shalom to you and everybody, y'all. Shalom, shalom. But yeah, we do have some precepts for it. Um, getting back to it, which kind of speaks to maybe that is the darkness that he's surrounded by. He's saying, um, now he's the sun and the moon is he's about to see, which, you know, I'm trying to get to because when Adam sees the sun for the first time, he thought he was going to die. He like, Oh man, it's over with. But um, once again, this darkness I feel like can also be likened to now that he's outside of paradise where everything is in order with Yah. He also now feels the wickedness. And, um, you know, I, 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 typically our people, when you talk to them, I haven't caught a lot of other people who say this, but, you know, it's like when you go somewhere, you can kind of feel. You know, and I, you know, back in the day, you would talk about that being your gut feeling or something. But now that I know some, got some sense about some things, it's the Ruach that y'all put in us all to where, um, just for myself as an example, back in the day when I used to like promote events and parties, I, I spent a lot of times in nightclubs and just in event spaces. And it, certain ones, as soon as you walk in, you can feel it like it's tension in here. And sure enough, every time you would have that feeling by the end of the night, somebody would be fighting. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you can feel disorder, I guess. And it, I think it's just something that Yah has put in us. Because um, you all, I'm sure, have other examples where when you've been somewhere, you could just feel like something is off. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you all probably have stories now to where, because I know I'm like this now, like if I walk some, if I go somewhere now and I feel like that, now that I'm acknowledging the Ruach HaKodesh, I'm up. If I go somewhere now and I feel like that, I ain't even sticking around. No, that's the Ruach telling me this ain't where you want to be. <laughs> but hallelujah. And I know we all have felt it before because so many people say it. Um Typically, our people is usually who I catch saying it, but I'm not saying can't no ain't nobody else had the feeling either. But I know, like my granny, my mom and them used to be big on that. My mama was really big on that coming up when you, because I was the type I remember as a child when we would go, kind of like Ariel, ironically, when we would go somewhere, you know, I'd get there and I'm talking to friends or something, and my mama would always pull me to the side, and I remember being like 10, 11 years old, and she would be like, whenever you go somewhere. Before you get to gallivanting around the room with your friends, she was like, you need to look around the room, see who there was going on. My mama was big on that with us when we was young. And when we would go places, I remember being places with my mama, and she would be like, you know, something about this don't feel right. We finna go. Like, she was big on that when I was young, and it just kind of carried over. But I, I know many people who have those kind of feelings. And it kind of seemed like this is what Adam, Adam, mind you, it was only Adam them. Y'all just reconciled them with the angels. 
Yet he can feel the darkness and he like, we surrounded by it. Because you're not under the light and the pleasantness of the garden no more. Chapter 12, a darkness came between Adam and Eve. Then Adam beat his chest, he and Eve, and they mourned the whole night. Oh, okay, that plays into it too. This is their first night. This is their first time being in life without light, right? Until the crack of dawn, and they sighed over the length of the night. And Miyazia. I wonder if this is a Hebrew word. Uh, let's look this up on something. Let's see. Yeah, search Google for it, I guess. Do we have anything for the word Miyazia? What kind of word is it? Is that Hebrew? Is it Ethiopian? I know they said they that uh, some of the translation from this came from the, Ethio the Ethiopic, which. You know, I know Ethiopia still carries one of the oldest translations of the Bible today. Um, I don't even know what this word means. That's an interesting word, though. In Miazia gives us a place that's interesting, you know. Those are the kind of little things like I just kind of be. Put some thought to it. I mean, it makes me wonder what exactly, where exactly, but. I looked it up. It says it's Arabic. Okay. And um, uh, it's Arabic and its origin is a crown and and, and it's wealth. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised it would be Arabic either because it said that the two translations for this, that it was translated into English from were Arabic and Ethiopic, so. But that's that's interesting that word being there. It's named because I believe it's trying to name like a place where they're at. Moving on. And Adam beat himself, his chest, and threw himself on the ground in the cave from bitter grief and because of the darkness and lay there is dead. And like I say, it's going to be a few times of this where it's like, and maybe because Adam don't fully understand this type of death either. Mind you, he's been in the garden. The animals ain't hunting. They ain't killing each other. Adam hasn't seen anything die, um, which is interesting in itself. Adam is so because I don't believe Adam is trying to commit suicide. I just believe he's doing things that he don't understand the impact on his body of what he's doing. And Yah is constantly raising him back up like, no, you got to walk this out to the end. That's too easy, which is kind of like how I read in Jeremiah 27 last week when y'all had Jeremiah tell the Israelites, y'all got to go under the yoke of the Babylonians and anybody who don't is going to die. That's too easy. No, you got to go and fulfill what you got to fulfill based off of what you've done. Heard the noise. Um. You got to mute, Mama Speed. You too. It's too loud. But Eve heard the noise he made and fell yeah. on the ground. And Sorry. She, it's all good. And she felt about for him with her hands and found him like a corpse. So it's still kind of dark in the cave. They can't see each other. <laughs> Eve just heard him fall. She heard a noise, which even, you know, it almost just kind of reminds you of being like a kid and playing the hide and seek in your granny house or y'all up sneaking through the house. You know, it's funny because, it, 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 well, they are really like children in a sense in this world, exploring this world. And you know how when you was a kid, like you getting up, you trying to sneak in the kitchen for some cookies. You know exactly where to walk, where the crates and the floor is at in the kitchen. And, and so her hearing this noise, it, it, it's kind of like a child feeling around like, OK, Something just fell over there. It kind of reminds me of a child in a way. But Eve heard the noise he made in falling on the ground, and she felt about for him with her hands and found him like a corpse. Then she was afraid, speechless, and remained by him. But the merciful Abiyah, or the merciful master, looked on the death of Adam and on Eve's silence from fear of the darkness, 
And the word of Elohim, once again, it makes a note to make sure you know it's the word of Yah coming to Adam which is Hamashiach, or at least we know him to be the word made flesh and raised him from his death. He is the resurrection and opened Eve's mouth that she might speak. Then Adam stood up in the cave and said, O Elohim, why has light departed from us and darkness covered us? Why did you leave us in this long darkness? Why do you plague us like this? And this darkness, oh, Yah, where was it before it covered us? It is because of this that we cannot see each other. For so long as we were in the garden, we neither saw nor even knew what darkness is. I was not hidden from Eve, neither was she hidden from me. Until now that she could not see him, see me. And no darkness came over us to separate us from each other. So it's like when the sun go down, he like the darkness is separating me from me and Eve from each other. But she and I were both in one bright light. I saw her and she saw me. Yet now, since we came into this cave, darkness has covered us and separated us from each other so that I do not see her and she does not see me. Oh, yeah. Will you then plague us with this darkness? And I, I just think it's so interesting how the first time they see darkness, their reaction to it. And, you know, the first they're going all of this stuff is the first time that mankind is experiencing um, any of these things. And I just think it's interesting. I go to die. You want to read the next chapter? OK. Uh, is it chapter 13? Yes, sir. Then when Elohim, who is merciful and full of pity, heard Adam's voice, he said to him, O oh Adam, so long as the good angel was obedient to me, a bright light rested on him and on his host. But when he transgressed my commandment, I deprived him of that bright nature and he became dark. So I believe him to be talking about house of time here. Um, I don't remember. It might've been one of y'all. We were just talking about the scripture. I think it was you, Daniel, where y'all says in Isaiah, I create the light and I create the darkness. Here, house of time was created in the same light as you, Adam, an angel in heaven. When he sinned against my commandments, he became dark, which in a sense, I created the light. And because I created all this perfect, I also created what became to be darkness. Verse four. And when he was in heaven, in the heavens, in the realms of light, he knew nothing of darkness, but he transgressed and I made him fall from the heaven unto the earth. And it was this darkness that came over him. Even the angel had to go through it, Adam. It's not just you. And you know, I, I guess, like he told Enoch, man can't have sympathy for the angels anyway. They should be praying for you. With that being said, though, because of what he did, we never really think of House of Time falling from heaven. And what did that do? To fall from heaven, being surrounded by light, and now you're on the earth like, we never really think of the, the the impact on him of the light being taken from him. Verse six. And on you, O Adam, while in my garden and obedient to me, did that bright light rest uh, also. But when I heard of your transgression, I deprived you of that, light, that bright light Yet, of my mercy, I did not turn you into darkness, but I made you your body of flesh over which I spread this skin in order that it might bear cold and heat. So even in your fall, I gave you something that was going to help you because I know now the sun's going to rise, the moon's going to come up at night. 
You're going to go through seasons, which at this time is just like what? Uh, spring and fall. Um, Cause I know, I know they ain't, that's a whole nother story about when did they see snow and rain, but I turned Hasatan's nature into darkness because of what he did. But you, I just gave you a body and flesh and made you come dwell in this world. I did not turn you into darkness. I think that's key to, to, to really key on that he said that to Adam. Remember, everything he's saying to Adam applies to us today. Remember that as we read this. Keep going. If I had met my wrath fall heavily on you, I should have destroyed you. And I had, and had I turned you into darkness, it would have been as if I had killed you. And this is why Hamashiach had to come and willingly give his life for Israel because I had got to the point with them where I was ready to kill all of y'all, our ancestors as a nation. And I can turn these rocks into the seed of Abraham. I didn't need y'all for that. But I had promised Abraham that I was going to have mercy and that I was going to visit in the covenant and all those things and the promise I had to fulfill. So Hamashiach had to come because Israel, you had to provoke me such a way by we get to that point to where I was going to destroy you. But the lamb you call the Messiah, my son, he literally, as the scriptures say, stood in the gap for you. This is why we work so hard to try to do this right. Somebody literally stood in the gap for us with a being that's above and beyond all things, the head of creation. And yes, the world and the nations, they got they do coming. But Israel, you was going to get yours first because I ain't have a covenant with them. I had it with you, though. And you more foul than them because you the one supposed to know better. You the one supposed to be the light of this world. You the one supposed to teach these folks how to be righteous and you acting just like them. Verse nine. But in my mercy, I have made you as you are. Then you transgress my commandment. Oh, Adam, I drove you from the garden and made you come forth into this land and commanded you to live in this cave and darkness covered you as it did over him who transgressed my commandment. Darkness just covers you. I turned his nature into darkness because you didn't see the throne. And no, you more fouled in the fall of man because you should have knew better. Which is what he says about the angels and Enoch too. Don't come up here and pray for them. They should be praying for you. Told Enoch they bogus for sending you up here to pray. Hey, y'all too. Enoch came up there and was like, I seen the angels in chains, y'all. They are the darkness. It's hectic. The ones who was messing with the women. Understand, every fallen angel didn't take a woman as a wife and have giants. Only a select group of them did that. And y'all put them under chains of darkness. And they tell Enoch, go, go pray for us. Since he basically, since we know you got his ear and he feel you, go pray for us. But Enoch got up there, he said, Look, I seen them on the darkness, it's hectic. Can you have mercy? I'm paraphrasing. Enoch said something along the line. And y'all told Enoch, they got audacity sending you in here. <laughs> no, I ain't doing nothing for them because of you. They filed. They supposed to be praying for you, which has always been a funny story to me. <laughs> but go ahead. Thus, O oh Adam, has the has the night, has this night deceived you? It is not to last forever, but it is only of 12 hours. When it is uh, over, daylight will return. It's only for the night. Now, I don't even really know how to even think of him saying it's only 12 hours. That could be in the translation of who translated it and how they saw the day. So we always try to be honest in the way things go. Because we know when Enoch, Enoch described the day in 18 parts. It don't tell us how many equivalent hours a part would be. So, you know. Just being honest about, I don't necessarily know that it's 12 hours. And we know, especially with daylight saving and all this nonsense going on over here, the day is 12 hours. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, Sign not, therefore, neither be removed. And said, 
and say not in your heart that this darkness is long and drags on wearily. And say not in your heart that I plague you with it. No, it's just it's just a physical thing for the night. No, they, no, I didn't give you the darkness that I gave the devil and his angels that fell with him. It's a whole nother level to this darkness. So don't let this darkness throw you off your square, Adam. Repent. You and Eve get this back right. Have kids. Teach them my way. Go ahead. Strengthen your heart and be not afraid. This darkness is not a punishment. But, oh, Adam, I have made the day and have placed the sun in it to give light in order that you and your children should do your work. I have made the day and placed the sun in it to give light in order that you and your children should do your work. Verse 13. For I knew you with sin and transgressors uh, come out of this land, yet I wouldn't force you, nor be heard over you, nor shut up, nor doom, uh, doomed uh, you through your fall, nor uh, through your coming out of the, from light into darkness, nor uh, nor yet through your coming from the garden into this land. I know the end from the beginning. I knew that you were going to do that. With that being said, that still gives you free will. But I knew that once I gave you Eve and your love for her, because basically Adam, who he's talking to, you chose your love for Eve over me. Eve sinned with the serpent. And when she brought it to you, you was like, I don't want to see y'all punish you alone. I was in here bored and alone before you. Uh, I won't tell the person say, how did Adam know he was alone? And it was just them. But on the same token, I believed he saw the animals being and creating and having families and all that in the garden. And that's how he knew he was alone. Because it was like, it's two, all these animals and they having children and I see little ones and it's just me. And Eve and Adam basically chose his love for his wife, which is what she is, over the commandments of Yah. And Yah's like, I knew you were going to do that. So, you know, all of this has really, even though you have fallen, all of even in your fall, same as Israel today with the 400 year prophecy, all this has been prepared for you, still. Keep going. For I made you of the light and I will to bring out children of the light from you and like to you. Hello, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I'm on the call. Oh. What's up? I don't know. <laughs> Man, we don't go. You were supposed to give me children of light. Like I say, he told them be fruitful and multiply in the garden. Um, and we know that the way that a woman gives birth to a child today was part of the punishment. She's going to bring forth children in sorrow. Um, it's beyond me. I don't I can't I don't know what that looks like, but they were supposed to have children of light as he's staying here in the garden. Verse 15. But you did not keep my commandments one day until I had finished the creation and blessed everything in it. I believe that one day is a thousand years, not a 24 hour day. It wasn't 24 hour days in the garden. There was no sun and moon to count it, but I don't know. Keep going. Then concerning the tree, I commanded you not to eat of it. Yet I knew that Satan, who deceived himself, uh, would also deceive you. Deceived himself. I like that. Keep going. So I made. Uh, I made known to you by means of the tree not to come near him. And I told you not to eat of the fruit thereof, nor to taste of it, nor yet to sit under it, nor to yield to it. Partake. Don't consume what he's selling. 18. 
had I not been and spoken to you, O Adam, concerning the tree, and had I left you without a commandment and you had sinned, it would have been an offense on my part for not having given you any order. You would uh, turn around and blame me for it. Abba Yah holds himself to the same Torah we, he holds us to. Had I not told you, Adam, then your blood would be on my hands. But I let you know. Verse 19. But I commanded you and warned you, and you failed, so, not, so that my creatures cannot blame me, but the blame rests on them alone. Oh, Adam. I have made the day so that you and your descendants can work and toil in it. And I have made the night for them to rest in it from, from their work. And for the beast of the field to go forth by night and look for their food. But little of darkness now remains, O oh Adam, and the daylight will soon appear. It's just a physical thing, Adam. It's not like what happened to the devil. And, you know, interestingly enough, um, I guess that's a way that we know the, the, the you know, like, because I know like a lot of the animals still do come out at night. If I am mistaken, lions come out at night. These coyotes just running through here. That's when they go out looking for food at night. Um, I don't know what all animals, but I'm sure some of you know. It's quite a few animals. You got the raccoons and all of that. Like, it's quite a few animals that come out and go forth um, at night to look for their food. And probably most of the, like, the meat-eater animals, if I had to guess, unless a lot of them, because a lot of the animals that's out in the day are, like, leafy, green animals. So, any questions or comments about that chapter? Thank you for the read, Obadiah. Anything anybody want to add Santa Adam. As we keep moving. Then Adam said to Abiyah, O Yah, take you my soul and let me not see this gloom anymore or remove me to some place where there is no darkness, which is funny. After all of that, <laughs> Yah is giving, he sent his word to give Adam all of that. Right. To basically encourage him. It's going to be OK. This is just for a moment. This ain't I haven't made your nature dark, just the physical uh, the thing that you're going through with the sun and rising and all of that. And Adam first word is I can't take this. Just take me home now. Nah, whatever got to happen. I'm ready. Just take me somewhere where there ain't no darkness. This is too much for me. But Elohim. Adonai said to Adam, indeed, I say to you, this darkness will pass from you every day I have determined for you until the fulfillment of my covenant, when I will save you and bring you back again into the garden, into the house of light you long for, in which there is no darkness. I will bring you to it in the kingdom of Elohim, or the kingdom of the Shemaim, which is heaven. And we just read that in Revelation. The city, no need for the sun because the lamb is the light and, and, and no sorrow and so on and so forth. All the things that Adam, are, is, which I think is interesting now that I think about it, all of the things that Adam is experiencing for the first time in Revelation, Yah is saying, those are all the things that when if you make it into the kingdom and you understand the prophecy of this book, as it says in Revelation, which is a blessing. You won't, your children won't experience that anymore. Again, said Elohim to Adam, all this misery, which was just part of the definition of darkness we just read, Koshek from Genesis 1, 4, 5, 6, one of them, that you have been made, all this misery that you have been made to take on yourself, excuse me, because of your transgression, will not free you from the hand of Hasatan and will not save you. But I will, 
Remember, he's calling them Elohim, but this is the word of Elohim, he said, talking to him, which makes sense. Ain't this how he talks? Only I, no man knows the father except for me and those who I reveal it to. Uh, I am the door and I am what he says that I, uh, I am the truth and this truth shall set you free. I am the door. I am the lamb. All of these things that's being stated here are things that we have heard Hamashiach say, right? Which I don't think there's no precept for I am the truth and the truth shall set you free. If I'm not mistaken in the Old Testament, that, that, um, see, I hear things like that and then we read things like that and I'm like, that's, that's a Mashiach quoting to us in the physical when he came to the, to the disciples, giving them the same speech he gave Adam in the beginning. None of this will free you, but I will. When I shall come down from the Shemaim and shall become flesh of your descendants and take on myself the infirmity, infirm, infirmity from which you suffer, then the darkness that covered you in this cave shall cover me in the grave. Remember, this is the word of Yah talking to him. When I am in the flesh of your descendants. Now, this prophecy here is why because it's like one of the first, if not the first, of Hamashiach. And this prophecy is why everybody who was uh, looking for this, because Noah would have taught this to Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. Ham and Yepheth was just like, whatever. Shem was all about it. For real, let me be on point. So my descendants, if it's now, or my descendants, whoever's here, be ready. This is how he got his line chosen. Point being made. Definitely Israel knew this, this prophecy and other prophecies, but they knew this prophecy. And this is why everybody in the line of righteousness, ironically, even still to this day, which is, 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 is really just kind of kind of deep to think about. Everybody has always been waiting for and or looking for. The Messiah to come in the flesh. Which is why. A lot of times in the New Testament where he would be around, it'll be like, even with John the Baptist, we just read when John the Baptist sent the servants to him. And what he told him, he said, go tell John this happened and that happened and this happened. And why? Because John, you know, with the prophecy, when Yah comes and then the other pieces of the prophecies, the prophets had, this is how it's going to look when he get here. Now go back and tell him this is exactly how I look when he get here. John still was like, well, I got a daughter. Huh? Man, it's hectic up here. We're here and there, but. He understood why then. And I, who am without years, shall be subject to the reckoning of years, of times, of months, and of days. And I shall be reckoned as one of the sons of men in order to save you. And Elohim ceased to commune with Adam, and then he gives us a precept. Let's see what they precepts are about. They got it. They all point to it. John 12, 46. I never even noticed they had that precept there. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believe on me should not abide in darkness, which once again is a precept to that. So um, I think it's interesting now that I think about so many quotes from uh, Yahushua that how it ties with not only this, but certain things in the book of Enoch, like when he tells, um, and I, I can't even think of where it said I once knew, but like when they asked him about the brothers, this brother had a wife, he died, he had, then the next brother had her as a wife, they died, they died, they died, the resurrection, who's would she be? And he said, none of them, because everybody who'll be raised, they won't be, have need of marriage. They'll be like the children of the Shemaim. That's not quoted from nowhere in the 66 books of the King James Bible that we had, not that I've, not that I've ever elected, but that is talk from the book of Enoch. So it always stood out to me like, this ain't even quoted in the prophets of nothing nowhere for him to say that like that. But I do, and I, I forgot where it was at. I have to find it. One of you all don't press me on it, but I believe that was talk that he quoted from the book of Enoch, just like now when you see certain scripts like this, which some of these scripts are in other places as well, but may have been quotes from this conversation that he was having with Adam, which Israel then would have understood much better than how we're trying to figure out 
the depths, which we know is deep, of what all has been stolen. But that was a good precept. Hallelujah. Then Adam and Eve cried and sorrowed by reason of Elohim's word to them. He tell them, be cool. I'm coming in the flesh. Y'all going to be good, your descendants. And they like, no, we ready to go right now. <laughs> Which is funny because that's Israelites today, man. We tired of this, man. When is the kingdom coming? And they ain't even, they, it ain't even about, you know, like no people or nothing. They just like, this world is not that. They cried and sorrow by reason of the Most High Yah's word to them that they should not return to the garden until the fulfillment of days decreed on them but mostly because Elohim had told them that he should suffer for their salvation. And I think that says a lot about Adam and Eve who have fallen. And yet part of their crying and sorrow, most of it is because Yah has just told them or the word of Yah has just told them that I am going to um, come down and suffer for your descendants so that they can get back into your salvation. And now Adam, like him and Eve, like, oh, we really messed up. Like the Mosiah has got to come here and he's going to have to suffer for us, for our children, because of what we did here, which shows humility on their part. And they're going to do a lot of repenting. That's something else I like about this. Adam and Eve didn't just sit back and be like, you know, like it's whatever. They do a lot of repenting in this book. Like, you know, we messed up and we need to do what we got to do to get this back right. Um but that's interesting that he that Adam is, you know, remorseful, I believe is the word, about hearing that that's what we're going to have to do. And we know Hamashiach is the fulfillment of this because the scripture says that he is the visible image of the invisible Elohim. And it wasn't the first time he came in a man. In Genesis 18, it says that, um, or at least in the appearance of a man. But in Genesis 18, when Abraham was sitting at the tent in the cool of the day, it said that he saw God, quote unquote, with two angels and he looked like a man. And we know that to be a Mashiach as well. So just some other, other spots to precept that. But After this, Adam and Eve continued to stand in the cave, praying and crying until the morning dawned on them. And this, this is actually kind of funny. It's kind of sad too, but this was kind of funny to me. And when they saw the light return to them, they were trained from fear and strengthened their hearts. Then Adam began to come out of the cave. And when he came to the mouth of it and stood and turned his face towards the east, so we know that the sun originally started to rose in the east and set in the west and still do that to this day. You got to be careful. They didn't change anything. So, because I know it's a lot of talk. Well, I guess it still could be flipped around north, south. But, you know, these are things that y'all does like they're going to change direction and time. And boom. the sun rolls in the east. The first time the sun, which mine, ironically, was like the, this is the first time the sun ever rose. <laughs> or at least the first time somebody saw it rise. And it rose in the east. So now when we see the sun rise in the east, we could be like, okay. Some of what y'all did here, he ain't let these heathens change everything. It's still some order to some of this. He turned to the east and he saw the sun rise and glow and rays and felt the heat thereof on his body. First time he felt the sun's heat or, yeah, because I think it was night. They pretty much been talking like it's been night time from the time that they left the garden, which makes sense because there was evening, then there was morning. It was a day like, uh, a coat he had an Zion pointed out in Genesis. So that makes sense that it would be, that's how it would start evening and morning, the same way the creation week go. Or I don't know if that's a week, that's probably like a 7,000 year period. But he felt the heat on his body for the first time and he was afraid of it. And he thought in his heart that, it's, that this flame came forth to plague him. And that's why I laugh because I remember it's times where I done read this and I kind of thought it was funny. Like, dang, Adam was so scared of the sun the first time. He thought he, he thought it was over with. But now that I really think about it, it, we would be the same way the first time you saw the sun. Because the sun is like a magnificent thing. You see it in the morning when it's rising. It's like all of these beautiful colors on the horizon. And then as it's going up, especially de depending on the time of year, like, you know, like I say, I don't know exactly where Adam is at here, but 
Adam could be like down in Texas somewhere. That son got up and it was 110. Adam like, man, <laughs> he might be like me. Like, dang, it's hot out here. <laughs> might have been somewhere like that around here, Florida or something. That son came up and Adam was like, it is hot. He then cried and beat his chest. Then he fell on the ground on his face and he made his request saying, oh, yeah, plague me not. Neither consume me, nor yet take away my life from the earth. And it's just interesting that at the first sunrise, Adam thought he was going to die. He thought it to be Yah coming to kill him. And that's probably something that we should make a note of as we are in these last days. And as we continue to look for signs and, and the different things that, because I, I think it's a scripture that talks about Hamashiach, or it says he's going to shoot across the sky like lightning, but I believe it's probably going to be just by Adam saying this is probably going to be similar to watching a sunrise in a way he's going to go across the sky. For he thought the sun was Elohim or the most high. Yah. I think that's how I think that's interesting. That, that was his first thought. Because while he was in the garden and heard the voice of Elohim and the sound he made in the garden and feared him, Adam never saw the brilliant light of the sun, neither did its flaming heat touch his body. Therefore, he was afraid of the sun when flaming rays of it reached him. He thought Elohim meant to plague him therewith all the days he had decreed for him. Is it possible that the sun looked different then? Without pollution and all the different things that men have done on this planet? The very first sunrise, is it possible that the sun was maybe looked bigger, brighter? This is something I wonder. Well, Adam also said in his thoughts, as Elohim did not plague us with darkness, behold, he has caused this sun to rise and to plague us with burning heat. It was hot. It was hot. 110. I feel like wherever he was at when the sun went up, it got up to like 105 or something. It was a real heat to where now he like, let me get in this cave, man. It's a little, it's kind of cool. But while he was thinking like this in his heart, once again, it, this book makes, makes a, a, a serious effort to let us know how often it's the word of Elohim that comes to talk to Adam. And he came to him and said, Oh, Adam, get up on your feet. This sun is not Elohim, but it has been created to give light by day. Of which I spoke to you in the cave, saying that the dawn would come and there would be light by day. But I am Elohim who comfort you in the night. And Elohim ceased to commune. What I done. Get up on your feet. Don't be scared. I just told you this sun was coming. And it is what it is. First sunrise ever. Adam was scared. He thought he was about to die. He thought it was the most high yacht. That's the chapter I was talking about um, with you, Big Mike, about the serpent here. Anybody want to read this next chapter? Somebody want to pick it up for us? Maybe I probably should have read it. But somebody want to pick it up? The floor is yours. Yeah. Oh, you. The Adam and Eve came out at the mouth of the cave and went uh, toward the garden. And now think about how many times it's been made note of how often they have been going back to the garden. Maybe that's why y'all took the garden from the earth. Like, nah, they, the garden is too, it's like, it's, it's becoming like temptation to them, man. They always going back to it. You got to go out and live, but go ahead. But as they went near it, for the, uh, before the western gate from that from which Hasatan came when he deceived uh, Adam and Eve, they found the serpent that had become the Satan, Ahasatan, uh, coming at the gate and sorrowfully uh, licking the dust and wiggling on its breast on the ground by reason of the curse that fell upon it oh, from it, Elohim. 
from Elohim. And it's interesting that they said that Hasatan came from the West into the garden. Um, and when he when he deceived them or whatever, that's interesting considering the world dynamic now. And the the the, the serpent is still on the west of the garden, and basically sorrowfully licking, saying the serpent. Which I say, I think the serpent was really an animal that the fallen angel possessed and made it do what it wanted to do. But either way, it's Saudi at Adam and Eve. Like, man, if y'all didn't get to playing around with <laughs> the tree, I still have my legs. Y'all was wilding. I think that's funny. Keep going. Um, and whereas before, the serpent was the most exalted of all beasts. I bet it was. Can you imagine? Like down there where you at. That's part of the reason I don't like the South because I don't like snakes and y'all got some wild snakes. I know y'all got rattlesnakes and everything. Can you imagine, Obadiah, if a six-foot rattlesnake walked up on you? I can't imagine uh, coming face to face with a snake at all, if, even if it's just a garden snake. You know, I I mean, I know that it's not poisonous, mm -hmm. but still, I'm weary of it because uh, it slithers. You know, it it's not a natural order of things. You know, uh, sure. animals have legs and feet and ears. And this thing doesn't have any of that. Now, it, now think, because I'm the same way. Seeing it slither on his belly just make my skin crawl. And to if we were then and one walked up, I don't even know, man. I I just couldn't. <laughs> I think that's worse than it slithering up. At least slithering up, I could run. Like one walked up on you like a man, two arms, two legs. He was six, seven. No, I couldn't do it. Start verse three over. And whereas before the serpent was the most exalted of all beasts, now it was changed and become slippery. Mm. And the meanest of them all, and it uh, crept on his breast and went on his belly. He's mad. He like, dude, I was him. You was playing with House of Time. Now I got to crawl on my feet. He became the meanest of them all. He's so mad. Verse four. And whereas it uh, was the fairest of all beasts, it had been changed and was become the ugliest of them all. You just said. And instead of feeding on the uh, best food, now he had turned to eat the dust. Instead of living as before in the best places, now he had lived in the dust. And you know what? Because in certain circles, you have people talk about reptilians as, as, as snake lizard-like people that walk upright, they aliens, they live in the earth, blah, 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 blah. I do think what the, what the reptile was before this would have been what man now tries to depict as a reptilian. I also, now that I think about it, knowing that Yah caused all these serpents to crawl on their belly because of this sin, know that I don't know if I can believe reptilians and aliens and this stay in the earth now because y'all made them all crawl on their belly. So if it is still a snake that walks up right, where did it come from? If we if y'all, if I believe our creator and our Elohim to be all powerful, where would one still be to be walking up right? Because it says now they live in the dust and he's mad about it. Verse five, go ahead. And whereas it had been the most beautiful of all beasts and of all which stood dumb at its beauty, it was now a heart of them. Mm -hmm. And again, whereas it lived in one of the beautiful home, in, in one beautiful home, it was what, to which all other animals came from elsewhere. And where he drank, they drank also from of the same. Now, after it had become venomous by reason of God's curse, 
all beasts fled from it, from its home, and would not drink of the water it drank, but fled from it. You know, when you think about it, like at watering holes and different things, even like you'll see the videos in Africa where you have all of the animals at the water hole, like the lions will be there with the stuff it eat. It's like it's peace at the hole. You never see nothing there with the snakes around when you really think about it. Um, and it's just a snake is just a nasty animal. Like when you, I, I'll be watching these videos in India. It's probably why I don't like them. I got to stop where they be like, they be catching these big, 50 foot pythons or whatever. And it's just like, no, <laughs> I don't never want to go there. You people just be in the crib and a python be snuck into your basement. Like, no, I just can't do that. Keep going. First, when, when, when the accused serpent saw Adam and Eve, it swelled, it, it swelled his head, stood on his tail, and with eyes blood red, acted like it would kill them. He was salty. It made uh, straight eyes for Eve and ran after her, while Adam, standing by, cried because he had no stick in his hand which uh, with which he could hit the serpent and did not know how to put it to death. But with a heart burning of, of for Eve, Adam approached the serpent and held it by the tail. When it turned toward him and said to him. So hold on. First off. So let me say that. And this is my opinion. Let me, let me preface what I'm going to say with this. But especially Adam and Eve, but I believe pre-flood because this is the first time the ground has been tilled. The food would have been, as we were just talking, I know a lot of people talk, this would have been non-GMO. This would have been the best food that the earth has ever produced. The biggest, the most fruitful, all of that. With that being said, Adam and Eve coming from their bright nature to clothe, to, to skin, um, just as a roundabout, I'm going to say that I believe Adam and Eve were probably 20 feet tall, which is why Enoch says that the giants are like 300 feet tall. This is why they're so big. I do not believe that Adam was six feet tall. I believe him to be 15, 20, maybe 25 feet tall. This is just my opinion. I believe that all of the animals pre-flood were bigger. It was more oxygen on the earth because the earth was surrounded by water. We know that Yah opened up the skies to let all the water down to flood the earth. And then it says it goes back into the earth, which I do believe that water goes back up into the heaven somehow. But I just believe that with more oxygen, and this is me thinking as a man, Father, forgive me. I believe that everything that lived pre-flood was bigger than it is today. I believe what we call lions today were probably three, four times bigger. Elephants is where you get the mammoth that they be trying to talk about that they can't find or whatever. Like elephants might have been 20, 30 feet tall. I can't go as far as dinosaurs because I know it's debate about dinosaurs. Did the fallen angels create them? Was it of the creation of Yah? Blah, blah, blah. Is they real? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But anything Yah created, I think, was bigger. I believe a giraffe, instead of being 10, 15 feet high as a giraffe head is now, I believe back then a giraffe head might have been 30, 40 feet high. I've always believed that. I say all that to say, because I believe Adam and Eve to be 15, 20 feet tall. This snake had to be you. <laughs> to stand up on his tail and act like it was finna kill them like bigger than the biggest snake you've ever seen on the planet and if you go search big snakes on YouTube boy in some of these jungles I think I want to say down in the Amazon too they didn't caught some like really big snakes and I'll say this snake is two three times bigger than the biggest snake you've ever seen which like I say, man, that's why Adam is who he is and I'm who I am, because I just don't know. He might have been in trouble this day. <laughs> Takes it her with me out there, no stick or nothing either. Like, man, run for your life. But I have to say that to get the visual of what I believe or I see as my opinion here going on. Verse four. Uh, before we uh, uh, start on four, the uh, anaconda is a big snake. 
but he is not the biggest snake on earth. The uh, most uh, gigantic uh, snakes come from Asia. Uh, there was one that they were featuring uh, on uh, TV, uh, YouTube, and so forth. He was three feet wide, and uh, I think uh, like 16 or 17 feet long, mm. that they get at least uh, 20 feet. Some of them have been known to get 20 feet long. Mm. But the, the, the highlight of the thing was that this little Asian baby, uh, he was – what three years old? He was playing with the uh, the snake. He was riding on the snake, and uh, he the snake came into the house, and the father just let the boy play with the snake. This snake was big enough that he could uh, eat a whole pig. Okay, it uh, really it could move fast. It could uh, eat anything it really wanted to. You know, but uh, 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 I could not understand how that man could let his child play with that snake. But anyway. And I see this snake six feet wide and 40 feet. <laughs> this ended with it said that when it turned towards him, the snake spoke. I think that's something important, too. Verse four. Oh, Adam, because of you. And because of Eve, I am slippery and go on my belly. Then, with his great strength, he threw down Adam and Eve and squeezed them and tried to kill them. But uh, Elohim sent an angel who threw the serpent away from them and raised them up. The word of Yah uh, came to the serpent and said to it, the first time I made you slick and made you to go on your belly, but I did not deprive you of your of speech. This time, however, you will be mute and you will and you and your race will speak no more because the first time my creatures were ruined because of you. And this time, you tried to kill them. Then the serpent was struck mute and was no longer able to speak. And a wind blew down from the Shemaim by the command of Elohim and carried away the serpent from Adam and Eve and threw it on the seashore where it had landed in India. This is interesting, as you just said, the biggest snakes is in Asia. Now, with all that being said, and I pose this question to you, because I had I had this conversation before with somebody about this book. Do you believe in the garden that the animals could speak? Or at least the snake could speak? Well, we know this snake spoke because it spoke to Eve, but I said that I'm of the belief that Hasatan um, kind of like how people say a demon it possessed the serpent and it's an animal but this animal could talk and y'all said I only made you sleep before but now I'm going to deprive you of speech so there was once a day that these animals at least the serpent the snake could talk regularly what do you think about that? Do you believe that that was really something that may have happened before? This is a part that always kind of stood out to me, the interaction with this snake. The fact that it's mad at Adam and Eve for sinning. How dare y'all sin? Look what you have made me have to do. And then to your point, it threw, a wind blew from the Shemaim, which we know wind hebraically could represent a spirit or a ruach. A ruach, a spirit from the Shemaim, carried it away into India, where ironically, today is where the biggest snakes on the planet live. You got any thought about that, Obadiah? Uh, now that you uh, bring it up, uh, I believe at some time uh, the snake uh, 
I had speech uh, because that's what it says that he spoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was seeing some of the older movies, uh, uh, clips of uh, people over in Thailand. Um, they had the King Cobra. And those things were, uh, well, the uh, uh, Asian people are not as tall, but uh, that thing was uh, uh, at least two feet above their heads. And uh, they uh, went to kiss it. So uh, I don't know if it was just their boldness or their uh, worship of, of uh, that serpent. But uh, why would you even go around something that's uh, venomous is going to kill you? And, uh, you know, it can outrun you. So why would you even go near it? I mean, to me, that's that's really <laughs> crazy. Sure. I, I think I think uh, they they possessed certain. Because uh, I've also uh, saw pictures, and this might just be an artist's uh, uh, conception of what he thought a snake looked like, but it had wings. Mm. I think there are some snakes with like some wings, if I'm mistaken, but I don't know. Not big wings, but I think they're all like some water moccasins or something. They can kind of like, you know, move about in that type of manner, but I don't know. Well, I know they have a lizard down in Australia can run on its hind legs and it has like a, uh, uh, some type of uh, thing around its neck that it can expand it to make it look make itself look more fierce but it's uh it's only a lizard a small lizard it's, it doesn't uh, it's not a foot long or anything like that it, but it will run after you you know so because a lot of things uh in a while uh, are not intimidated by man you know they'll they'll uh you know like a badger or uh, or a small animal like that will, uh, and even even a uh, a small uh, a caiman, you know, they'll come at a man. Uh, you know, e even if they figure that the man's uh, strength is uh, equal to them, they figure that uh, you know their boldness uh, or their hunger, they can uh, overtake you. So. It is an interesting thing. You know, all of that kind of makes Genesis 3-1 now where it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field. Um, and we know the word for subtle here is cunning, crafty, prudent. Um, I don't know, man, but once upon a time, the serpent was a sight to see. It's still a sight to see because it's, it's one of the weirder animals, but once upon a time, the serpent was a sight to see. Walked upright and could speak. It's interesting. Any questions or comments about anything we read tonight before next week? Or before we go? We're going to stop right there. This was another good read. It's, it's always a lot of nuggets in this stuff. It's, it's a lot to take in with this book. The first sunrise. Next time you see the sunrise, remember how our forefather was. <laughs> Next time one of you up somewhere, you see the sunrise. Think about Adam when he saw that sun coming up. I'd like to make a comment about snakes. It's on you. When I was younger, my grandfather used to tell us of a snake called a coach whip that would stand up on its tail and chase you. Mm. And when you stop, it would stop. When you run, it would run chase you. It wouldn't bite you. Just scared the heck out of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where was he at? North Carolina. Oh, man. he That might have just threw me off from going down there. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Agnabi, you see one of them, Mark? I don't know how you getting around. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Oh man, we doing some coats down there, man. I oh that might have just messed my experience. So snakes, man. Snakes are some interesting things. It's a lot of them too. They are very interesting. I just don't like them though. Oh yeah, Andrew, you ever seen one of them? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. Well, I think everybody good. would know if I saw one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been moved back. You woke up and one of them was in the garage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have left all my stuff here too, honestly, and just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is funny. No, snakes are an interesting thing, but I don't know. Something else that this, you know, like I say, I just have ideas. These are my opinions that I'm speaking on this, but something else that make me wonder when this snake spoke, what did he speak? Did he speak Hebrew? I'm assuming he did. Did this serpent speak Hebrew? I feel like it's a correlation to that too in the way that the language has been used or even hijacked in Yiddish and thrown around. I think it's something to that too. It's an interesting thing. Always a pleasure, everybody. Anybody else got something before we pray out? Give me something to eat before I read some accounting for the night. What you said the name of that snake was? A who? A coach whip. I looked that yeah, up. Yeah, it's the coach whip. And um, I just pulled it up to see if because he said they were pretty extinct in the Carolinas at that time. Mm. Um, but they say they're in Texas as well. Oh, man. Known for being fast and not agile. They're non-venomous. Four to five feet long, but can grow up to eight feet. Wow. Ooh. And it'll stand up on his tail and chase you. Mm-hmm. Sound like this snake. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Hey. We just thank God we got for protecting us. That's a lot in this world. Books like this just kind of reinforce for me how much mankind does not know about this world. Oh, yes. That's what I always say about the, the, the ocean, the sea. Yeah. Nobody knows what's under there. Yeah, I don't much mess around with it either. He didn't kill everything in the sea. When, he, when you read the Noah story, he said that everything that breathed air died. He, he didn't kill everything in the sea. You got some ancient, ancient animals down in the sea that I wouldn't, I, I just, I ain't got the heart for the sea either. But hallelujah, thanks for the point. Anything anybody else got before we pray out? Always good to see all y'all. The first book of Enoch. We're probably going to read the second one too, but we're going to walk this down. Man. I'm not, not Enoch. Adam and Eve. It's a, lot of good, it's a lot of good nuggets in here. It's always interesting to see the first time Adam encountered a lot of these things that we encounter every day and just take for granted. As we humble our hearts and our minds and Get ready to give all honor, glory, and praise to the Most High Yah. We say thank you, Father Yah, for enlightenment, encouragement, keeping us driven, Father, keeping us focused, keeping us inspired. We thank you for everybody who made it to the call, Abba Yah, that during this season of the witch and this, this, this Babylonian election cycle where anything is possible, that you will protect all of the chosen. As, as Shaul said, we pray all the day long that all of Israel will be saved, knowing that only you know. We heard of it was bomb, being bomb threats, Abba Yah, down in some communities that may be more than likely predominantly um, occupied by your people. And I don't know what all of them believe, but I just pray you have mercy on all of Israel in these areas as the heathen rages about his election. I pray that you protect our people as only you can. You protect all of our children, Father Yah. I pray that you forgive us all of our sins this evening, Abba Yah, and helps, uh, help us all to see where we may err, even if it's just in 
the fruits of the spirit, patient and humility or being more joyful, showing more love, being more uh, um, long suffering and kind. Help us to correct ourselves in these last days. I'll be is this clock is ticking. The world is speeding up. The times have noticeably been sped up. The days are flying by, it seems like, Abiyah. And help us to know that through all of this, your word will always be true. And that everything that you said you will do, you've done. And every door that you said you would open, you've opened. And every door that needs to be closed, you will close. We ask you to fulfill all of your word for us today. I'll be honest, no matter who's elected and what happens, we lean to you prepare a table for us in front of our enemy. We lean to, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will be with us and help us not to be judgmental, Abiyah, of our ox and the coat, some within the truth, some with, who are out, who aren't in, who may still participate in the process, Father Yah. Help put the words in our mouth to address any situation in righteousness and however you may feel and not our own personal feelings of what we think you think about such processes. In the name of Yahushua, no matter what the case may be, help us all to remember who our true king and kinsman redeemer is, who our high priest, who our example, the light that came in the world, the light that was separated from the darkness the lamb in the city that will be the light thereof. Keep us protected from all the serpents, Abiyah, and from all of the beasts of the field, Abiyah, that may uh, fill a way towards us in general, but especially those who have now come back into your fold, Father Yah, come back into your understanding and, and are exhibiting the behavior and which you have commanded our people when we made the covenant, a behavior that sticks out like a sore thumb in the world of darkness and wickedness and lasciviousness, Abiyah. We understand that we can't hide. A light cannot be hid under a bushel. So we just ask you, Abiyah, to cause us to shine bright and let your word be true that the darkness cannot comprehend that light, that our temples are clean and that you will sit your throne as the authority on our lives and our hearts. I pray that everybody is healthy and whole in this hour and anybody who hears this who is not, if it be your holy will, I'll be out that you touch somebody's life tonight and that you make sure that we all always know that it was you and that we give you the proper glory and praise deserving of the creator and also of the word of Yah that was created that came and willingly gave his life for a sinful natured people and for a world that did not deserve, but only because your word is true and you promised that you would. In his name we pray, hallelujah and amen. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Shalom, shalom. Everybody be safe. Man. They run in the street. <laughs> yeah, you also. Yeah, it's rabid voters out here. Everybody be safe, man. Yeah, absolutely. Hallelujah. Good evening. Shalom, family. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom.